reading today is Psalm number one, which can be found on page 489 of your Bible. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The epistle reading comes from 1 John 5, verses 9 through 13, which is on page 241. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. <clears throat> Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And finally, our Gospel reading comes from John 17, verses 6 to 19, which can be found on page 111. <coughs> made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their, their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord God, 
Empty me of all of me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, so that all the words that come from my mouth come directly from you, and not from me. And open the ears and the hearts of all those listening, so that they know how you are calling them to be here today. <coughs> Throughout Christian history, there have been a number, numerous amount of movements to create a separate, holy community disconnected from the world. There were monasteries, convents, communal livings, utopias, retreat centers, reform movements, and attempts by radicalistic leaders to reclaim the primitive practices of Christianity. In the passage from the Gospel of John that was read today, the author is addressing the Johannine community, a community that found themselves desiring to be a separate community living apart from the rest of the world that was oppressing them for their belief in the Gospel. They thought this would help them remain faithful or holy to Christ. Yet, in this passage, Jesus is reminding them to go into the world. The world that God so loved that he gave his only son for. This passage has been interpreted in many ways that have muddied the waters of what it means to live in this world, but not of this world. It's possible that these waters were muddied because of John's Gospel's understanding of what it means, the world. The word used here is a Greek term called cosmos, which gets translated as world. <coughs> but John's understanding is different from all the other Gospels, and even different from our modern understanding. You see, the other Gospels understand this cos word cosmos, to mean the physical earth. For John, it is also the physical earth, but it is more than that. It is also sometimes referring to any of the inhabitants of the earth. And even sometimes other, he also is referring to anything that opposes Christ as the world. He will sometimes use it in one term as opposed to another, and other times using all three. We must keep this in mind as we explore this passage to understand what it means to live in this world, but not of this world. If we take a closer look at this passage, passage Jesus reveals what it means to live in this world but not of the world. Beginning with this passage, we are reminded that to live in this world, but not of this world, we must keep the word like Jesus kept the word. Again, there's another term here used by John's Gospel that can be translated very differently. It's the Greek term logos. To keep the word, we need to understand what John is saying on half, what that word is. To understand what that word is, we can go back to the beginning of John's Gospel, which is likely familiar to many of you, where John reminds us that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John views Jesus as the Word of God made flesh. The Word that in the beginning created all things. Logos, or Word, was counteracting the Greek understanding of gods that were separated from this earth. John instead is trying to help these Johanna community understand that God is a God who is involved counter and intricately and passionately 
among the world. For John, Logos is a living being and the source of all life. It is the life breath of all things living. To sum up, we are reminded that we are to keep this word of God, this living thing, just as Jesus example in his life and ministry. We are reminded that to live in this world but not of this world means that we have to remember that everything we have is given from God. In this passage, this verb forgive is found nine different times. And each time it is referencing God as the giver. It is God who gives the disciples. It is God who gives word. It is God who gives Jesus. It is God who gives the words. God is not the one who is controlling everything. But God gives everything. This prayer by Jesus does not ask God to use God's almighty powers to, to control what's going on, but that God helps his disciples care for the gifts that they have been given. He reminds us that to live in this world but not of this world means we need to recall that we are one with him. We are reminded that Jesus came into the world making people one with him by meeting them where they were at. Since Jesus met us where we were at, so we are called to be like him and meet others where they are at not expecting them to come to us. As I read through this portion of the passage, I was reminded of a story that I had heard recently in one of my classes. It was about a church, a southern church, that was, began as an inner city church. They became very large, and as the city became larger, they realized that the neighborhood around them was changing. Now this was a primarily white church, and the area around them was becoming primarily African American. Out of their uncomfortableness, they decided that it would be best for church growth to move their church several miles west of the city in a suburban area. They get there, and they start planning hours on end on how they are going to get people into their church to grow their church even more. They talked about having the latest technology, the newest music. They talked about training greeters to be better greeters. They finally had a plan and they implemented it. And the result was failure. They forgot that Jesus said, go into the world. This passage reminds us that when we are called to live in this world, that means we believe that God can use man's evil acts to bring about God's purpose in the world. Just like he used Judas' betrayal to bring about God's salvation for the world, we are reminded that God can use what may seemingly be the most worst possible situations of our lives for God's purpose in the world, even if it's hard to imagine the possibility. He reminds us that to live in this world, we must be joyful, knowing that he prays for us. <laughs> this whole passage is Christ's prayer for his disciples and for those who would come after. Jesus realized that his disciples 
disciples must live in this world. And because of this, he prays that they may find joy among one another. He's not saying that they should abandon this world because he speaks these things in this world. He wants his disciples to have joy among one another so that they may be so joy-filled that they can go out into the world and share that joy. <clears throat> Jesus reminds us that we are not called out of this world, but to be protected from the evil of the world. Jesus did not ask God to have his disciples removed. Rather, he asked to have them protected. He reminds us that this world is a temporary residing place for his followers. You know, Moses, Elijah, and Jonah all asked to be removed from this world. God did not grant their request. Because the place for the people of God is in this world. To bring God to the world. He reminds us that to live in this world, but not of this world, means we must believe that the word is truth. And that we are sanctified in truth. To be sanctified in truth means being <clears throat> made holy or set apart. John's Gospel suggests that Jesus himself was sanctified when he set himself apart for God's purpose. By letting himself willingly die on the cross and take up that cross with his resurrection. To really understand what the implications of sanctification, we return to Jesus' own words earlier. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Our sanctification there comes freely at a cost to us, through God, through Christ. But it is not cheap grace. It comes also in the experience of losing our own worldly lives. Jesus reminds us that to living in this world but not of this world means we are called to go into the world and make disciples just as Christ came to this world and made disciples. At this point, Jesus speaks the command that is the peak of this whole passage. And he says this, As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Christ's life was not one that tried to escape the world, but was one who lived among it and engaged with it. In the world, he was willing to give up his life to save because he loved it so much. To summarize what Jesus' message was to all of his 11 disciples that were present and all who were disciples that were to come after, including you and me. God is calling us to live in this world, but not of this world. And that means we do not let the world's ideal shape our identity, or our values, or our faith. We meet and love people where they are at, not expecting them to come to us. We are set apart to bring the good news of the gospel to the world. And just as Christ summed up in his final commandment, to live in this world but not of this world means we are called to love one another as Christ loves us.